And we're going to conclude with um, <coughs> Melina Abdullah. Um, great that she's, we're able to have her speaking here. Yeah, please. Thanks. Do they have it? Yeah, I just, I'm passing down the computer, so I think. Melina is a member of the LA uh, County Human Rights Commission. She's the author of many articles and book chapters on hip hop, on movement building, and black police and black politics, including the emergence of a black feminist leadership model, African American women and political activism in the 19th century. Melina, thanks very much for coming. Thank you. So um, those are my, I guess, academic um, identifiers, but I'm also one of the founding members of, or founding organizers of Black Lives Matter. Um, and so myself, and you actually have three of the founding members of Black Lives Matter who go to UCLA. So Shamel Bell is here. Um, she was in the original organizing group. And then to BC Lake Griffin, I think can't get in the room. I think, yeah, yeah, she's, yeah. She's part of the overflow room. And then Lola Fagbamila is a third member. And so I just want to um, talk a little bit about kind of that trajectory, how Black Lives Matter began. Um, um, and it, will it, yeah, play from, yeah, thank you. Um, how Black Lives Matter began and kind of what it is we're doing and how you can get involved. Um, so I always have a, a, an ask at the end because I don't think that there's very much point in doing these kinds of conversations to just kind of engage in dialogue. I think it's what you do when you get out of the room. Um, so thank you all for inviting me and thank you for having this conversation and the energy that I'm feeling is that many of you hopefully um, will be inspired to engage um, after you leave here today. So what happened for me is kind, was kind of touched upon a little bit, um, that we had been in the midst of a bunch of episodes, and I'm from East Oakland, and we, are, we come out of the womb. I was born in the 70s, but I'm still 29 in my mind, right? <laughs> um, um, but uh, yes, right. I was born in the 70s in East Oakland, so all of our parents are like Panthers, right, or... Um, black power organizers or organizers, we come out politicized. So sometimes when I teach, we get into these conversations. So what was your first protest? I do not know because I was born on a picket line, right? So um, what happened for me is when I moved to Los Angeles, I became involved here in LA and I moved here for grad school at that other school across town. Um, <laughs> But at the time um, that I moved here, they were looking at, uh, Maxine Waters was convening these hearings about whether or not the CIA brought crack cocaine into South LA. So I became involved in some of that work. And then I remember just things kind of rolling out almost every six months, there would be some kind of crisis in our community. There was, um, you know, the killing of Margaret Mitchell, the homeless woman who was killed for carrying a screwdriver, right? Um, and then the one that hit me the hardest was 10 years ago, I don't know if you all remember, but there was a 13-year-old boy named Devin Brown who was killed in a hail of bullets um, for joyriding in his father's girlfriend's car. And um, they basically said that the car was a weapon and they killed this little boy. And so there was um, all of this organizing that happened. And I became a part of that here in Los Angeles. And it became like every six months it was time to get out in the streets again. And I think that's kind of what you were talking about, Michael, right? So Oscar Grant, it's time to get out in the streets again. And all of this stuff is happening. And there's these episodes. I think this is what Brenda Stevenson writes on, right? Like these episodes, right? And so these episodes were happening. And for a lot of us, um, we'd been a part of each of the episodes. And when Trayvon Martin was killed, we were waiting because we thought finally, remember, we had won a little victory after, the, um, after Johannes Meserly was locked up, right? Um, because he was locked up, it was the first time in history a police officer had actually been convicted for killing someone on the job, right? And so we were going, um, this is great, but then we were also mad, because I think he got out in three months. I think he might have been sentenced to, um, to, I think he was sentenced to 13 months, but he served less than a year. 
And so I remember afterwards, I think we were on the phone going, let's go find him. Right. We were riding around trying. They, but they let him out through this like little underground tunnel. Right. And we couldn't. Tabisi Lay, I know, was with me. We were like trying to figure out how to find the underground tunnel, but we couldn't. Right. I don't know what we were going to do because like, you know, but we wanted to at least scare him. Right. Um, so I think that when Trayvon Martin was killed and, um, uh, we were watching, um, George Zimmerman's The Trial, we had this, um, kind of sense that Brenda Stevenson would be right, that each thing would build upon each other, right? And that the little glimpse of justice we got with Johannes Meserly would mean that George Zimmerman was really going to get it because he also was a fake cop, a cop in his own mind, not a real cop, right? And so we were thinking that something might happen. And so I remember, if you all remember, it happened on a Saturday, right? The verdict came in on a Saturday. And I was out shopping for a used car because my family had grown and we needed more seats, right? And we're at, at CarMax, and it's nighttime now here, like it's evening in L.A. So in Florida, it's really night, right? So we're thinking the verdict's not coming in today. So my brother calls me, and he goes, where are you at? And I tell him where I am. He goes, you're not going to like it. And he tells me, you know, that he got off. And I was like, what do you mean he got off? Because every one of us, I think, really were holding on to hope that Zimmerman would be convicted, Right. And so I'm in this fog and we kind of go home and I feed the kids and I put them to bed. And then I called over a neighbor to watch the kids. And I think I called you, Shamel. Um, yeah. Yeah. I called Shamel and Shawnee and Stacy. It was three black moms. Right. And we decided that we were going to do what every black person in Los Angeles does when we get mad, which is what? Go to Lamar Park, right? And so everybody got the secret underground railroad memo, and we all went to Lamar Park. And there were masses of us. There were thousands of people in Lamar Park, and we didn't have a plan. We didn't know what we were going to do, but this kind of collective rage starts bubbling up. And so um, we just started marching. And I know all we kept yelling is, Go north! Don't go south! Go north! Because if you go south, you're heading into the black neighborhood, right? So we were like, go north, because then if we get north of Wilshire, that's what we kept saying. If we get north of Wilshire, then at least we'll be in their hood, right? And so we keep moving north. And Charlia, who was one of my students at Cal State LA, was like this track star, and she's like running. We're like dipping through Krispy Kreme parking lot, trying to get around police. Um, and we make it all the way up to Hollywood and Highland. And we're out to like 4 o'clock in the morning. And I guarantee, uh, in two days, I lost six pounds. It was awesome, <laughs> right? Um, so I go home, you know, 4 a.m. And then the next day, yeah, it's great exercise, right? Um, the next day, we decided we were going to go back out. And we, like, intuitively shut down the 10 freeway, right? And so that evening... I get this text from the sister named Tonda Seasway Chimarenga. I don't know if you all know her, but if you're not following her on Twitter, if you don't read her pieces, you need to start doing that immediately because we need to tell our own stories. Tondi is our real life Ida B. Wells now, right? Like, so if you think about who Ida B. Wells was during the what the period known as the lynching movement, for this new lynching period, Tandy sees Wei Chimarenga is our Ida B. Wells, okay? So Tandy texts me and she goes, and I imagine the text sounded like this if it had a voice. Meet at St. Elmo's Village at 9 p.m., right? <laughs> of course, the text didn't really whisper. Um, but I sent the word out to all my comrades and we go to this beautiful place. If you don't know St. Elmo's Village, it's this black artist community. And we go there and um, we can go to the first real slide now. Um, and we go there and um, uh, we meet up with a sister who I'd been working with for some time, Patrice Colors. And she had the foresight to say, this is not going to be just another episode, right? This is not going to be just another moment of us gathering in Lamert Park and marching and yelling and being angry, right? We're going to take that rage and turn it into something. And so we didn't have a name for it quite yet. 
Um, well, she had been talking with Alicia, Alicia Garza up in Oakland, and Alicia had written this love letter to black people and signed it, Black Lives Matter. But we, were, we sat there and we brainstormed, how do we make this a movement, not just a moment? And so we developed um, this kind of framework Black Lives Matter is working for a world where black lives are no longer systematically and intentionally targeted for demise. And we need to understand that, that this is not a couple of, like you all said, bad actors. It's not bad police officers. It's an entirely bad policing system. It's an entirely flawed public safety system. And it's intentional and it's systematic. Um, and so if we read people like Manning Marable, he writes on this when he talks about black ra racism against black people, that this doesn't just happened to be. We didn't just stumble upon it. The system created itself to target us, to exploit us, and to benefit from the racism that it exacts upon us, right? We affirm our, contributor, our, our contributions to this society, our humanity, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression. And so when we think about Black Lives Matter, we need to think about it as an affirmation of our own humanity. I think Cheryl said it, that, you know, it's not about pleading with white people or with a system that oppresses us to see our humanity it's for us to recognize it in ourselves and to affirm it in ourselves and to step into it for ourselves we have put our sweat equity and love for black people into creating a political project taking the hashtag off of social media and into the streets so it is a hashtag, but it was never just a hashtag. Really, I would say Black Lives Matter formed before it was called Black Lives Matter, right? Right, when we were J for TMLA, right? We were Black Lives Matter. This is what was bubbling up. The call for Black Lives to Matter is a rallying cry for all black lives striving for liberation. And so what that means is, um, and if we go to the next slide, um, these are the three women who are, um, the founders are credited with being the founders of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors, um, Alicia Garza, and Opal, who is um, an organizer with Baji, um, Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Um, and Alicia is an organizer up in the Bay. Patrice is here in Los Angeles. Um, and so when we think about it, Black Lives Matter was founded by three queer black women. Right. And so when we say all black lives matter, we mean black women's lives matter. We mean black children's lives matter. We mean black queer folks lives matter, black trans folks. And we mean that regardless if your pants are sagging or if you have a law degree, your life matters. It doesn't matter that you were scared about uh, uh, scared of Michael Brown. It doesn't matter that you were scared of him. It doesn't matter that Eric Garner was selling bootleg cigarettes, right? It, that doesn't matter, right? His life matters. All of our lives matter. And really, that's your problem. If you're scared of Michael Brown, then maybe you need to see a psychologist, right? You know, and so we need to lift that up. This is um, Charlia. This is the track star I was telling you about. Um, so this was one of the things we did a week after... Um, we formed is Justice for Trayvon Martin Los Angeles. And you'll see a little hashtag on the top of her poster that says Black Lives Matter. We didn't really realize it was going to stay around as long as it did. Um, this is when we decided we kept this notion up of we have to bring it to their hood. So this is that famous kind of plaza on Rodeo and Wilshire. Um, and we decided we were going to take it over. And so this was, she's the track star, so she's running to the top of the steps. All the rest of us are behind her. Like, you're pushing Sejani, right? I'm with, I'm in, right? We got our babies with us. Um, and we kind of take this over. If we go to the next slide, it'll kind of point to, this slide is to point to what our approach is. Because it's really important that you understand that when we do our organizing, we have thought it out. We do it in a particular way and for particular reasons. One, we want to raise awareness. We want people to know that the 2012 Malcolm X Grassroots Movement report is phenomenal. But we need to also understand, like, I don't know if you all have been feeling the way many of us have been feeling, but every time a police officer gets off, you go... Now that's going to tell the rest of them that they'll get off too, right? And so I was going, I wish I was a quantitative um, uh, methodologist, but I'm not, right? So I was trying to get with my homegirl over at LMU, Angela James, and trying to get her to crunch the numbers, but someone just did. And so they updated that Malcolm X Grassroots Movement report, and we are now at every 14 hours. 
every 14 hours somebody black is killed by law and by police officers, vigilantes or security. And so that's a doubling in less than five years. Right. Um, and so we need to raise awareness. You need to know that. Right. And then you need to be angry enough to do something about it. So not just sit here in your little space at UCLA and think, well, this is interesting to study. Right. But also get out into the streets and not just y'all get out into the streets, but everybody out into the streets. So the folks who are in Watts, the folks who are on 65th and Broadway, the folks who are in northwest Pasadena, everybody needs to be mobilized and everybody needs to be doing the work. We believe in group centered leadership in Black Lives Matter and what that means, and we're taking that from Ella Baker. What that means is that all of us have the capacity to be organizers, right? And all of us do it in the in different ways. I am the least artistic person that you'll ever meet, right? But we have lots of artists in BLM, right? They make amazing art. That picture of Alicia Patrice and Opal, right, is beautiful, but I couldn't have drawn it, right? But what I can do is I'm really good at kind of figuring out how to say it in a particular way, right? So that's my contribution. Shamel is a dancer. I didn't even know that dance could be used for the movement but we took over LAPD headquarters for 18 days um, back at the beginning of January and one of the most important pieces that we did out there was this crunk dance um, thing that I didn't do with you but like a bunch of folks did it right and it went viral and it really kind of helped to elevate the struggle for justice for Ezell Ford and so there's different ways that you can contribute and all of those things are leadership right we're also very intentionally black led and ally supported. And so what that means is white folks got to check your egos, right? We don't want you in front of a camera right now. This is not about you, right? It's about all of our struggles for a more just world. But what that means is that black people have the vision and the ability to vision our own models of what liberation looks like. And we want you to help us, but we want you to allow us um, that even doesn't sound right. But we want you to step back so that we can step forward and push our vision forward. Um, and so we have the best allies in the world, right? So I'll talk about an action that we did on Saturday. Um, it's not about... Um, there was some conversation for new people about segregation. It's not about segregating. It's about recognizing roles, right? Fifth, we disrupt the system. So we shut it down, right? So we intentionally are shutting down freeways, right? We intentionally shut down Third and Fairfax on Saturday and shut down all those little um, upscale eateries and restaurant row. We did all that Saturday. We're shutting it down because as long as state sanctioned violence only exists in black neighborhoods, no one else cares about it, right? And so we are going to shut it down every chance we get. Shut down Walmart's as part of that, right? We're going to vision a free and just world and we're going to build the world we want. So in some these two things are we are a revolutionary organization. We don't believe in just reform. We believe in dismantling a system that is fundamentally flawed, fundamentally oppressive and exploitative and building something new. Next slide, please. So this is what we did for May Day. Um, this is just some of us out at the May Day March downtown and we can... I think I'm running out of time, so I want to go to the next slide. Um, this is what we did for the National Day of Action. Um, so we have now 28 Black Lives Matter chapters. Black Lives Matter is a real organization. We don't believe that we have to have the law to affirm that, so we're not a 501c3, right? We exist because we exist, right? We have 28 chapters. All 28 chapters participated in this National Day of Action. Baltimore Solidarity, and this is a period that we're calling our Black Spring, right? Um, so this is the action that I was talking to you about. We went into restaurants like Lowry's, like uh, the Stinking Rose, like um, all of those on Restaurant Row, and we read this Langston Hughes poem. Negroes, sweet and docile, meek, humble, and kind. Beware the day they change their mind. And you should have seen the people in there. They were so scared, right? <laughs> um, then we marched and we marched and we shut down the intersection on 3rd and Fairfax. You can kind of see that here. This is the shutting down of the intersection here. What you'll see like right back here is our allies. So there were about 300 of us 
the black people took the center of the intersection, but then we were surrounded by allies, white allies, Asian allies, indigenous allies, Latino allies, and they sat down around us in that intersection to make sure that the cars wouldn't come through and hit us. Because they do do that sometimes, right? And so that's how that kind of played out um, if we go forward to the next one. So these are some of the things that we're doing. Um, we have the Ezel Ford case, which is um, what caused us to take over LAPD headquarters for 18 days. Um, we had two demands there, firing the officers and filing murder charges against them, but we're kind of evolving. We're also very fluid in our stance. We understand that filing murder charges, and even if they're convicted, that doesn't do everything that we need to do. So we want to reimagine public safety, which gets to this kind of Kendrick McDade case. Um, I want to just briefly mention the, the killing of Brother Africa downtown on Skid Row. Um, which really lifts up the need for partnerships and alliances. So we have several um, actual formal partnerships, one with the Black Worker Center, one with LA CAN, LA Community Action Network, who does the majority of the really, really good work on Skid Row, um, and a brother named Pete White down there. And so what we've done around the Brother Africa case is also recognize the role that um, capitalism and um, the role that the super exploitation, especially of black people, kind of plays in um, allowing for state sanctioned violence. But this last case is the one that I'm uh, probably most excited about um, in terms of what it can bring for us. I don't know if you all remember the ki killing of Kendrick McDade in Pasadena in 2012, but Kendrick McDade was walking home. He was followed by Pasadena police. He was um, hunted and killed. Um, they thoughtfully turned their sirens and lights off, um, and Professor um, Harris will attest to the fact that when they took, when, when police turn off their lights and sirens, that means that they're not recording, right? So they only, the camera, the dash cams are triggered by lights and sirens, right? So when they turn them off, they knew what they were doing. They cornered him, they killed him, shot him eight times, and then they ran him over with the police car. Okay. Now they say it was an accident, but this OIR report comes out by this guy, Michael Janako, who goes around and does like these independent reviews of police departments. They're always pro-police. <coughs> In this case, it was scathing. It said not only were the people who killed the officers who killed Kendrick McDade at fault, but the entire Pasadena Police Department is fundamentally um, just rotten from top to bottom. So you know what happens? The police union steps in and has the report sealed. The court reversed itself um, two weeks ago and unsealed 80% of that report. Why I'm saying I'm optimistic about it is because that report shows how systematic and intentional this kind of policing is. And I think it really opens it up for us to reimagine what public safety looks like. We could do things like demanding really radical transformations of public safety where we say things like, if police can't control their weapons, maybe they shouldn't have them. Right. Maybe we should not only demilitarize the police, but disarm them. Maybe we should think about what all the data says really creates safer communities and invest in things like after school programs, like livable wage jobs, like full employment and do that kind of work. Right. Rather than overspending on police. Where am I on time? Do I have two minutes or am I done? OK, I would show you a video, but I will put this up. I'll email that to you. Um, it's uh, an action that we did at the Grove at the end of the year. So you could kind of see how Black Lives Matter does its work. Um, but I encourage you to get involved. Follow us on Twitter at BLMLA. So this is my ask. Follow us. There are a couple of events coming up. Manifest Justice is open now. Please go to manifestjustice.org. Um, it's at 3741 La Brea. Please come out and support. And then we have monthly meetings of Black Lives Matter. Um, and that is going to be our next meeting is May 17th. It's open to everyone. You don't have to be black to come to the meetings. Um, it's usually at Community Coalition. But follow us or add us on Facebook, and it'll give you that address. Thanks so much, Malia.